Hello. In this part of our uh, week 10 series, we are going to look at um, how it is that the uh, screen which we created in the last part will be used for uh, the, the actual application. But before we go ahead, I want to point out something interesting about how HTML works. So let's take a look at this. I, I just wrote to, to draw this screen as I saw as we saw last time, I just created a file called register.html. It's just a layout so that you can experiment with what goes on before we actually make it a part of the application. And we saw how to get at this kind of shape. But there's something interesting you should note about how HTML sizing works. We saw that in our, if you want to get a stable 20% uh, uh, distance from, from the top, then you have to use something called viewport dimensions, which is which says padding top equals 20 VH. And if you look on the web, you will find an explanation. So what this says is it divides the vertical height into 100 parts and takes 20 of them to talk about uh, how much space to use. But here's something interesting. If you, if you look at the actual size of the body, as you can see, the, uh, the, the browser shows you that the body is 909.6 .9 pixels by 259. And the body, in fact, ends right after the buttons are done. So as soon as this is done, the, the uh, body is, is ending. What about the rest of the space that was below this part of, of, of the page? The answer is that the height of the body in normal HTML is determined by the content. And that's not just uh, the body. All tags in HTML are expressed in percentages of the size of their container. So the container for the body is actually the tag called HTML. And it is the size of the HTML tag that decides how the body will be measured and so on as parts of uh, the, the structure. The exception to this is the direct use of viewport sizes in talking about uh, how to lay the page out. But it is natural to think, for example, that the entire page you see is in fact the entire body and that is not the case. So, for example, as I as I make this this browser, let's say smaller and smaller, then automatically at some point the scroll bar appears because the uh, it's not possible to lay down the entire content of the page in the available space. Similarly, if I had a lot of uh, text here below, a scroll bar would automatically appear. So, in fact, it is the available content which decides the size of the page and not the page itself. But when thinking about these kinds of applications, the ones that send information, get it and so on, which are not really necessarily document like, it is useful to uh, be able to think of the entire available viewport as your page and be able to extend the body to the bottom whenever the content is smaller. This makes it a little bit easier to see what is going on. And you can actually achieve that by doing the following. So what we are going to do is to uh, add a style for the body that says the following. So it, it is we are going to we are going to add three things. We are going to say that the margin of the body should be zero. The padding should be zero and the minimum height of the body. So minimum means if there isn't enough content, then the height should be 100 percent of the viewport height. And before we see the effect, let's look carefully at how the coloring here gets used, right? So, so here what we have is that um, the, the colors are used to show you the uh, layout as, as we have, as you can see here. So if you, if you go here, this is the, the actual content of the entire body. This is the, the body itself. This part is the border and around this there is in fact the margin which you can which as I, as you can see the margin is highlighted. Now what we are going to do is remove both the padding and the margin so that there really uh, isn't uh, anything except the content that we have added 
and whatever padding is there should be explicit. In this case, it looks like the padding is already zero, but uh, and so so we we don't especially uh, uh, wonder we, we don't especially have to do anything for the padding, but you can remove the margin as well if you want to uh, have type control on how the space is used. So to do this. I have changed this thing and now here what I'm going to do is uh, save this thing and reload and at this point as you can see when I move over the body tag or when I move over the content here the entire content is the, the page as you can see and so now we know exactly what elements there are as far as the outward body is concerned and then you can lay things out inside it and be assured uh, about what is going on. And uh, uh, this remains the case no matter what you do. So for example, here, see the size of the body again is filling the page. And now I'm going to make it so small that a scroll bar appears. And in that case, the body is now extending below the fold. So uh, because the scroll bar will, will take over the rest of the area so up to here and if I if I go here again as you can see with the dotted border they are showing you exactly how far the body extends so so this is how uh, space gets used in the HTML and as we saw last time we have created this entire thing basically as a table um, although in some more advanced uh, ways to use CSS you don't need these kinds of tables for this thing to Okay, so with that clarification of how sizing works, we will go ahead and use this page in our application. Let's begin by looking at uh, how the app looks like in actual use and then we will see uh, how it is that, that we achieve that particular behavior. So first when we visit this app, as you can see, the uh, plain screen appears asking us to fill in some words here and then uh, register and expense and report and so on but here is the thing last time when we looked at this we had already uh, put various things into the database and in this development of the app we are only going to look at using this part of the app as a way to retrieve information that is already in the database. Then we will see what it takes to put the information into the database first in the form of a simple Java program and then we will include that in the uh, actual uh, app. The reason to do it stepwise like this is that while uh, querying a database to get the data in there is, is relatively simple Updating a database is not quite that simple. The reason is that the behaviors that we want from the app when it comes to updates are not at all simple to understand. So to get a feel for, for what that is like, see, suppose you have register users, enter expenses and get report. It seems like these are, these are straightforward tasks, but actually when you look at it, complications start arising. For example, let's say you register users. Then a question becomes, have I registered before? What if uh, you have two people there with the same name? What will you do then? How will you distinguish these things? So even something as simple as registration is not at all uh, actually simple. And in part, we solve this problem via some mechanisms of the database and in part by uh, some mechanisms uh, within the program itself. Same thing happens with enter expenses. Suppose you have to enter expenses. What if you enter a wrong expense? So now all of a sudden you have to support deletion when you didn't actually plan any such thing. What if you accidentally put a double input? That would again be a similar issue. With get report, because it's a query, things are relatively simple. You can ask for more or less detailed reports. But to begin with, let us see how to interact with the application uh, purely as a, as a query in the query. Okay, let us first take a look at uh, how what we did in the database. Um, I have connected here as the NPTEL user 
to this in Bitel database. And when you, uh, sorry, as, as a root user, because I have changed the prompt so that the, the current user shows up. So I'm using the database called NPTEL and within NPTEL there are these three tables. So expenses and users are the tables we looked at last time. Users 2 is a new table, we'll see what that is for. But um, let's see what the tables are and remind ourselves of how we had constructed them. So when you describe expenses, you see that it has an expense ID, it has an expense creation time, it has a user ID and it has the amount spent. Uh, all three of these are 64-bit identifiers um, and uh, the, the expense ID is the so-called primary key. If you look at users, there is a similar structure where you have a user ID, you have a creation time, and you have the name of the user. Here, <coughs> the pr primary key is the user ID. And as we have seen last time, we can do several queries which allow us to see the results of these databases. And it is the result of these queries that our application is going to show us. So with that in mind, let us see how the application behaves. By the way, um, before we go there, I'm just going to show you what all there is. So select star from users. Uh, these are the users and uh, creation time, I have left it as a 64-bit as a number. And as we saw last time, we can just use whatever number we want. Typically, a good number to use is, in fact, the number of uh, the standard Unix time, which is milliseconds from a certain chosen instant in 1970, which is how the, the system measures it. There are many different reasons to use this uh, particular uh, notation for time. Among other things, it is easy to share amongst different computers and you can convert it to various forms uh, on the output side. So this is what we have for users and as far as expenses are concerned, we have these expenses here. And these two expenses are available. And when we need to, we can actually combine the two and see what the result looks like. So let's take a look at the application behavior given this content of the database. Okay. So in the beginning, when we visit the application, we get our, our first thing. Now, we are not going to register a new user. If we did, the system is going to just ignore it. But I'm going to press the register button anyway. What this will do is show you the users who are already there. So let's go there. So as you can see, the, the page just updates itself and it shows you these users. Now, one question is, how did we get this table layout and what is going on here? <clears throat> so to get an get an idea of this, we will take a look at the structure of this HTML in a little bit. But um, let's, to, to get another sense of this, let's take a look at what happens if we ask for expenses. So uh, just to double check, by the way, let's make sure that uh, these are indeed the users that are there in our database, right? So user ID 1234 and accordingly there is this creation time and there is the <coughs> user name that we put in. The interesting thing about this is uh, where the Java application had all these blank areas and whatnot, here we have a nicely structured output. As we have seen, HTML makes it relatively easy to get nice clean looking output like this once you learn some of the nuances. So let's see what expenses look like. So this is expenses by user. This is the expense creation time, the user ID and the amount. And in this case, we chose to leave the expense ID out of it uh, because the, the, uh, to the end user, it doesn't mean much of anything, um, except that we may find it useful when we have to implement, let's say, deletion. All right, now let's see what the report button says. So report button updates the app and what you see is the expense report. It says the expense occurred at this time. 
and because the the time intervals that we have used are you know 133 and 3334 these many seconds so what we see here is that converted into the uh, a more readable readable format and we'll see how to do that and then it combines the expense report combines data from the users which gives it a name and the expenses themselves which are written in terms of ids and shows you the result accordingly so now we are going to try to understand the structure of this app and as you can see we have enough pieces put together that this app is now beginning to look like uh, our initial simple application uh, but but a much slicker form with better layout and so on and so forth we have four screens in this app one screen if you just highlight the url and and get it this is the screen you get when you haven't pressed any button and whenever you press a button you get a uh, screen that is that is uh, uh, particular to that particular button press so here we have register here we have expense and here we have a report one thing that is happening is because we are doing this as a succession of post requests as you will see all of these uh, visits will show up in the in the history of the browser there are different reasons why you should or should not have such a thing and uh, we will take a look at that uh, in 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 a little bit but for now this is our simple app which simply retrieves whatever it is that the database has and shows it to us let's begin to understand the app by looking at what is in the war file so tvf is uh, this jar command has a has a standard form so here v is for verbose t is for uh, showing the contents and f is for the war file itself if i do this list here is what i find so first of all there is this meta inf and manifest which is created by the jar command as we have uh, seen before and inside the jsp directory i have four jsps each one of them corresponding to the four pages so so when you visit for the first time there is nothing on the page then after that you can do either register or report or expense and correspondingly there are four jsps then in the classes what we have is a single class called fair share show and in the libraries we have tag libraries tag libraries are for the jsp tags as we have seen before and then these are the standard things web.xml shows you how the web urls are connected to uh, the the java servlet methods and context.xml is intended for uh, connecting via the, the uh, connecting the database via jndi as we have also seen earlier all right so with that let us see the next step is to look at what is in web.xml and this is what what we see so here we have some display name etc i need to update this to fair share show this is a old name this is the resource ref which tells you where the database is from and this is the same thing that we did earlier in in one of our classes and then you have the servlet here the name of the servlet is app and the servlet class is nptel.fairshareshow and the mapping says that the url slash which is the only url in this app is mapped to this particular servlet so whatever there are no special urls that single url is being reused for everything because there is no flow of pages we are refreshing the same page again and again this style is sometimes called a single page app and if you look at discussions on the web they tend to be somewhat elaborate about uh, what this app is for um, it doesn't have to be as complicated as they make out to be uh, at the same time it uh, there is a, a technical reason why these things are called single page apps whereas the kind of app which we are building which rebuilds the entire page from the server every single time is not quite called that but the effect is the same we aren't changing the url 
we are keeping the url the same and showing you the the results of what it is we get we could do a different design in which the the report being shown for instance is not on the same page and it each uh, report has 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 a distinct result but that is kind of clumsy to use for a app like this most of the times what we want is you know the same three things that we are going to do so let's just keep the same page much like uh, a gui system would all right so with that let us see what all this looks like and how these four pages are actually driven we have to everything is contained within this class so so let's take a look at that so this is fair share show dot java and this is the usual you know servlets and all have these hundreds of imports but here we have fair share show and uh, http servlet as usual the two key methods are of course do get and do post which will be called for get and post from tomcat there is something interesting here the do get uh, method actually just uh, sets this particular attribute and and passes it down to post and just directly calls it that way this is just because we are doing very similar things later when we start distinguishing between uh, the behavior of get and post we will need to do something different over here but for now this is quite simple this is where all the logic is going on and so what we do is these two are standard of course you know get writer and all those things we set a attribute for the title and here we look for the para request parameter which is what the buttons in the form come back as so to refresh your memory let's take a look at say uh, the init jsp and uh, besides this thing which we discussed to get the appearance right what we have here is this kind of thing so the the value of the name of the button shows up as a parameter as we as we know from from earlier uh, from earlier discussions so you can have three types of buttons and if that parameter is not null then that means that button has been pressed i just remember that in a boolean variable and then we do something fairly straightforward you connect to the database if it's register do uh, you know run the query that is related to register remember that we are not registering anything we are just querying the existing things that we have registered we will get into updating the database in the next part of of this series and then um, as usual you run a query and convert the contents into a list of hash maps as we have seen before set that query data as user data and then uh, include this thing these are standard jsp things that we have seen before then if it is expense do something similar if it is report the query is somewhat complicated as we have seen it combines two uh, of these things and uh, we have actually seen this query before so it is this query it says select convert uh, take ec time convert it to the unix timestamp rename that as at time is the u name and the amount as a combination of information in the users table and in the expenses table such that the user ids in the two table are a match so we take this query and put it in this string and then uh, uh report and each time we are getting you know register jsp expense jsp report jsp etc you create the query run the query and the rest of the processing is is the same and if none of the buttons has been pressed which is when you visit the url either by you know typing it in the browser or visiting it from a link then you call init.jsp and the processing remains the same if there is a failure then you have a sql exception which you can dump 
if there is any other failure then we are currently just going to print a stack trace eventually we will get these traces into the log and the web page but for now we'll just leave it to be dumped so in the sql exception dump we try to get a lot of this information we will look at what this information is for and how we use it in a in a little while and then connect db is the same thing you have seen before this part is for m testing with embedded tomcat i am just leaving it here to give you a flavor of what goes on but as far as you are concerned you can live with this jndi based system and if we get time we will look at the embedded tomcat at least mention what goes on for testing these kinds of things and then finally you know after everything is done we close the database which means you close all these objects this is the do query and this is the list to maps that we have seen from before so all in all for each page there is a jsp depending on whether which button is pressed you pick up the jsp and you serve it it's as simple as that now let's take a look at the jsps themselves here is init.jsp init.jsp is just the layout page that we have discussed with all these height and width and this and that and then uh, if you look at the first one say register.jsp it basically takes has the same code and adds to it this particular table and in this table we do the adjustments that are needed to get the layout that we want let's take a look at uh, what those adjustments are by the way you will notice that i am repeating everything and copying and cutting and pasting you shouldn't normally in a production code when so much structure is shared you can use include files and other things to to uh, reduce to actually uh, uh, share this structure directly we will take a look at that but for this kind of application it is not that important given that we are just showing how the pieces are put together the include file will enable us to avoid this kind of cutting and pasting and studying this part is what the goal of our current discussion is so here you can see there is a div and let's take a look at the appearance of this thing and i will go over it so here since we are looking at register let's just press the button and get the registered users part the html code we are seeing here is the html code that produces this part of the page okay so first of all we have a table and the width of the table is 22 em so um, the idea is that i wanted a table which is slightly larger than the the area spanned by by this uh, part of the page it's a bit of a pain to use uh, maybe i can yeah so so this is the area i'm talking about right and uh, this area is corresponding to the div that we are looking for all right now let's see what this thing shows so uh, we have the div and just like we arranged for 20 units of of the of the view port i have arranged for a 10 unit separation because that looks reasonably balanced to me but you can of course play with it we have a caption by uh, creating the height of the caption i have created some space around it and the style of table borders that i am using many uh, user interface designers uh, have learned over time that the simplest kind of table is something that puts these horizontal lines and leaves the columns without any column separations and uh, it's not that bad looking so uh, we will stick with it i kind of like this kind of spare uh, style 
if you would like a different design by all means do that in this table what we have is table headers which is created by this row and this part the for each loop that produces this uh, these set of these sets of rows is the for each loop that we have seen before uh, from the tag library it gets the user data and remember user data is from fair share show this is this kind of thing so here we have queue data and for the expenses we have we have expense data and for users we have user data okay and that user data is what we are looking at for every single uh, row in that in that in that list we take a we get a hash map and the hash map tells us what user id seat time and u name are which are the results returned by the query these are the ones that we are seeing here what is new here is that all the all the cell description the td elements have something called a class td bottom and the headers have another class called th top and bottom this again is this kind of class thing is again a part of css for every node in in uh, html you can add a class which says that this particular header is of the type th top and bottom so table header with the top and bottom and this table cell here is of type td bottom so it only has a as a single border is what we want to say what a class defines is a style so that instead of using uh, this explicit style attribute as we have seen before we will be able to get some information from the style section so let's take a look at both of these things at the same time so here we have a div and at the top here we have the style area with a definition for th top bot let me uh, maybe make this clearer like this so notice one thing a class has this syntax beginning with a dot i'm not going to get into the details of css syntax you can always uh, look up some of the details but we don't really have that much time to spend on things like css i'll show you examples of the mindset that is involved so here we gather together this thing into a class and we say that it has a bottom border and it has a top border and for the table itself what we have done is we haven't specified a border at all and so there is no implicit border we actually get to say what this is and for the table cells we will say that the alignment has to be at the center as you can see in the table and the only border is a bottom border one pixel solid black the alignment for the header is already center that is given simply by using th and therefore with with uh, uh, this uh, uh, css we have the table appearance that that we wanted as usual if you want to actually play with it and look at some of the details you can always open up the web development tools the web developer tools and start looking at uh, what all is is involved so here we have uh, our our div the overall big div inside it there is a form and then there is the second div which has the separation that we that we wanted table body uh, a table row which is the header and these are the cells 
and if you if you highlight this it will show you the same thing which it got from that from that style section if you remove the text align you know the alignment of all the cells shifts and if you remove bottom border the the border goes away and then it comes back so we have de defined a bunch of other things like the padding we want and so on and so forth as we have already seen before and this is how we got uh, this relatively clean layout of 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 um, the information that we wanted mm -hmm.